Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Shannon and I am from the Abrams Planetarium at Michigan State University and we are here with another video for the Grand Ledge Area District Libraries. This time we're going to be talking about meteors, meteorites, uh, comets, and these transient things that happen in our skies and within our solar system. So things that aren't there pretty much every night or every year necessarily, though some are, we're going to talk all about those. What I thought we would start off with is some definitions, uh, some questions that we might get asked quite often. Like what's the difference between an asteroid, a meteoroid, a meteorite, a meteor? Uh, and so we're gonna take a look at that. So here's our solar system right here. We have our sun more or less in the center, followed by Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars's orbits, and that makes our inner solar system. Then outside of Mars orbit, we have the main asteroid belt and then Jupiter. So between Mars and Jupiter's orbits, we have the main asteroid belt. And so they, asteroids are basically relatively large rocks that are in our solar system. They're not large enough to be a planet for the most part. They do not stick together to form a planet in the first place. So it's just relatively small, often potato-shaped rocks that are out in our solar system. Smaller versions of those uh, are called meteoroids. Uh, anything that really has the potential to fall through the Earth's atmosphere is a meteoroid. Now, sometimes the orbits of these rocks will get sort of knocked around uh, and they'll be pushed to something that takes them closer to Earth. So Jupiter often uh, will do this. Jupiter is kind of a big gravitational bully, and so it will push the asteroids around a little bit. But every once in a while, we'll have a good chunk that will come towards the Earth and fall through our atmosphere. As it's falling, uh, that material will start to cause friction. Um, through between the rock and the atmosphere. And that friction causes it to heat up and shine as it falls through. And we end up with this very quick streak of light like we have here. This is a meteor that is falling through our atmosphere. This is about a two second exposure show or so. What we would see is more of a quick thin line of light, but this is showing us a little bit more detail about what's going on. But as it's falling, that is a meteor. Now, if it's large enough and there's something left over during this process of heating up and shining and it lands on Earth, what lands on Earth is a meteorite. But as it's falling, it is a meteor. Now, this is happening every single day. We have small bits of rock and dust from uh, the solar system that will fall through our atmosphere and give us a nice bright meteor just like this. Happens every day. Uh, but most of the time, it's a very small speck that's left over and everything gets burnt up completely. But occasionally, we'll get some larger chunks that will land and become meteorites. Now, a very well-known version of this or well-known uh, event that happened was about seven years ago in February of 2013. And it was in Chelyabinsk, Russia. And so over on the left-hand side here, we actually see a couple pieces of that meteorite. This is a very loosely held together rock that fell through our atmosphere. And so in ex it exploded in the atmosphere as it, as it came through and it sent a shockwave through that actually broke windows throughout uh, that region of Russia. So you can see uh, this is an example of a building where all the glass is on the floor that on the right hand side here that fell because of that shockwave. So it broke apart and we ended up with all these small little pieces of the Chelyabinsk meteorite. So on the left hand side, we have sort of on the bottom, a small piece of Chelyabinsk uh, that was sort of intact. That's the whole piece that got burnt up a little bit and then landed. And then on the top is actually a, a larger piece that was cut open so we could see inside. You can see it's made up of all these small little pieces that got stuck to, together out in space. And so this is a type of meteorite that's made primarily out of rock. Uh, there's also bigger ones, uh, even bigger ones, like this one here. The uh, Campo de, del Cielo is uh, the field of heaven in Argentina. So several thousand years ago, a much larger meteorite fell down in Argentina and actually uh, broke apart and left several craters in this field of heaven, or Campo del Cielo. 
Uh, and there are small pieces that you can still find that had broken off, like what we have on the left there. And these meteorites I'm showing you are the ones that I happen to have at my house. The Abrams Planetarium has a very lovely collection, including the most complete collection of Michigan meteorites. So the meteorites that have been found and identified here in Michigan. And we're working on an exhibit that will hopefully be open around the time we get to reopen, though it's exact, uh, everything's a little up in the air due to COVID, of course. Uh, but this is a small piece. You can see this one looks a little bit different. It's a bit shinier. And that's because uh, this meteorite uh, is made out of iron. So some meteor, a lot of meteors are made out of stone and rock. We call those me a stony meteorites. Some are made out of iron and some are sort of a mix. Um, we call those ones stony iron because we're really good at naming things. Uh, another example that is perhaps a little closer to home is the Canyon Diablo meteorite. So again, a small sample up in the upper left corner that I happen to have at home. And then below that, you see a larger chunk of this meteorite that's been cut open. And it's been etched with a light acid. And so this pattern that you see, this sort of triangular crosshatch pattern, that's called the Widmann-Staten pattern. And this is crystallized iron and nickel, which only happens out in space because it has to cool less than a degree a year. Um, it's really, really slow cooling there. And so this one's been cut open and etched. This one um, in particular, I believe, is the one that's at the Field Museum in Chicago, but we have our own sample of this at the Abrams Planetarium that will be on display with our new exhibit as well. Now these larger ones, these larger chunks like the Campo del, Campo del Cielo and Canyon Diablo, they will leave behind craters. So in the upper right, you will see a picture of the Behringer Crater, also sometimes called Meteor Crater in Arizona, which is near, uh, which is where these meteorites were found. So you can see this huge crater that was left behind. Most meteors that fall through our atmosphere, again, will burn up. And if something does land, it doesn't always leave a crater. Most recently in Michigan in 2018, we did have the Hamburg meteorite fall uh, near Hamburg, Michigan. And uh, that one was very small. It broke apart into about uh, several different pieces. We found about 30 or so, so far. And uh, that one didn't really leave a crater behind. It wasn't really massive enough or didn't have enough energy in order to fall. So again, everyday kind of meteors, you will end up with um, just that meteor and everything burns up. Occasionally a small bit will land. Um, though we are starting to learn about micrometeorites, so there are these really tiny microscopic ones that you can actually gather out of like your uh, your gutters or on the roofs of buildings um, that you have to really, there's a process that you can go through to find them, uh, but you can go check that out. Uh, we also have very regular meteor showers that happen every year at the same time. And these are related to comets. So comets are, have these very long elliptical orbits. So this uh, animation is showing us the comet Swift-Tuttle and how it orbits around in our solar system. So the closer something is to the sun, the faster it will orbit, and the farther away it is, the slower it orbits. So comets have these really elliptical, really stretched out orbits where they spend most of their time far away from the sun, just kind of hanging out but they will spend these also close amount of, um, when they get closer to the sun, they'll sort of whip around it. Here, let's watch this again. But you can see what we wanna look at with this particular one, the comet Swift-Tuttle, is that it will cross into Earth's orbit. Earth is represented by the red circle in this animation. So it crosses our orbit. It doesn't actually meet up with Earth, which is good, because then it would crash into Earth. And that hasn't happened, that won't happen, but, since it crosses into our orbit, it will leave behind a debris field from its tail that hangs out and orbits around the solar system crossing Earth's path. So every year when we get to that point in our orbit, same point every year, same time of the year, we'll pick up that debris left from the comet's tail uh, like bugs on a windshield. And that's when we end up with meteor showers. And so let's go take a look at our night sky. We're gonna use a software 
called Stellarium. It is completely free and you can get it from Stellarium.org and I recommend it. It's a really lovely program. It works on pretty much all computers, uh, Mac, Windows, and Linux. And uh, we really like it a whole lot. When we don't have access to our planetarium right now, we really enjoy using this program to show some things. So let's go take a look at our night sky. I have us set to August 13th, which is when you should be seeing this. But if you do end up watching this another day, uh, this is going to be true for any time within August, really. So here we are. We're looking north, and I have us set to about 1015 on August 13th. Now when we look towards the north, let's just orient ourselves a little bit. We have our Big Dipper right now in the northwest in the summertime. Here is the handle of the Big Dipper with these three stars. And these four stars make the bowl of the Big Dipper. So we'll go ahead and turn on the lines here. It's officially a part of the uh, uh, constellation Ursa Major or the Big Bear, but we will focus on this Big Dipper shape within the bear. Now these outer two stars here, if we draw a line and keep going, we find the North Star here, which is part of our Little Dipper or Ursa Minor. Next, as we go from the Big Dipper's tail to the North Star uh, and about the same distance again, we'll find this W shape here. And this is the constellation of Cassiopeia. And so right underneath Cassiopeia, if we kind of take this long, this arm right here of the W and make a T shape, we come down to this triangle here. This marks the head of Perseus, the constellation Perseus. So let's go ahead and turn on the name so we can see that. So there we go, Perseus. Now this doesn't quite draw the lines completely, but this little triangle marks his head. Now another way to find it is this part of Cassiopeia, the pointier point, if you will, points in this direction towards this long slender A shape which marks the constellation Andromeda. Right here by the way is the Andromeda galaxy uh, named after the constellation it is in. Um, if you were in a really dark sky site you might be able to see that naked eye with averted vision. If not you can point a telescope over here and see that. But if we follow Andromeda here and these are her feet right here sort of at her feet you can also find the head of Perseus. The reason why I want us to find Perseus is because we have a meteor shower happening right now. It is peaking right now. The peak is August 12th and 13th, and that is called the Perseids, named after Perseus, because you will be able to see meteors and quite a few of them in the evening time, and it will look like they're originating from right by Perseus's head. And the nice thing about Stellarium is we can actually turn that on and see the points where the Perseids will originate. So again, as the Earth comes into this debris field left by a comet's tail, we'll get these small little bits of dust that will fall through our atmosphere and burn up. They don't usually leave anything behind. They're so small they'll burn up completely. But if you were to see these meteors and trace them back, they will look like they are coming from this point. They will all look that way. And if we stay here long enough, we might actually see one from Stellarium. Now, this is pretty low in the sky at 1015 at night uh, in the northeast. We want them to be pretty high. So when you look up meteor showers, you will find a term associated with them called the zenith hourly rate, or the ZHR. We're going to go to about 315 in the morning. Um, the ZHR is how many meteors we would see per hour if the radiant point was at zenith. So it's basically under the most ideal circumstances we would see that many meteors. So for the Perseids this year, the ZHR is about 100. So under ideal circumstances, we would see 100 meteors per hour if we were to watch them up here. Now we're not under ideal circumstances, so you'll likely see far less than that, but with that high of a ZHR, even under less, less than ideal circumstances, go outside, let your eyes adjust for about 20 minutes, get a comfy lawn chair, go find Perseus up in the sky, and then you'll be able to probably see several over the course of an hour to 
quite a few more depending on how dark your sky is. But you do want to go out at about 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning when they are very nice and high and it's very dark outside. Now right here you can see um, this is on the 14th. If we go back to the morning of the 13th, um, the peak is the 12th and the 13th, but the 14th it should still be pretty nice to see. Uh, the peaks are the best times, but generally you have a few weeks on either end of the peak to see them. Now right now we are competing with the moon. Some of them are quite faint and the moon is going to be bright enough to block some of those out. So we do have a waning crescent moon, but it's still pretty bright. So you'll mostly be able to see the brightest ones. It'll also affect how many you will see. So the moon is a bit of a problem, but you will be able to see the Perseids coming out of Perseus. Now, if we look over here in the south, you will see there's quite a few more. And we have a lot of these meteor showers every year. There's a lot of comets in our solar system that have left debris trails behind. But these ones are not generally as bright or as easy to see, but that doesn't mean that if you look in this direction, you won't see any meteors. And also, we are constantly having other stray bits that are coming through our atmosphere. So you might see a meteor that is not related to a meteor shower any other time of the year or even if you go out tonight to look. But the meteor showers are going to be the best times to give you a leg up in trying to find them. So let's head over um, real quick and take a look at what meteor showers we have coming up this year. So like I said, the Perseids are peaking around August 12th and 13th, but you do have a couple weeks on either end of the peak to check these out. The ZHR is quite high at about 100. In October, in late October, the 20th through the 21st, we will have the peak of the Orionids. So these will look like they're coming out from near Betelgeuse, the bright red shoulder star of the constellation Orion. It's not a very high ZHR this year, only about 10 or 20, but you can still get cozy outside and probably catch a few. In November, November 16th through the 17th, we will have the Leonids. And so the Leonids will look like they are coming out of the constellation Leo. And this year they are at about 15. So again, not a very high ZHR. Though these numbers do change through the year. The peak usually happens the same couple of dates every year. But the ZHR can change because there can be perturbations within the debris field. If, say, um, the debris field or the orbit takes it near Jupiter's orbit, if Jupiter gets close to that debris field one, one year, it'll sort of clump things together a little bit. And then when that clump gets to Earth, we will get a much better view of uh, the meteors that year. So we had particularly good Leonids in the past. This year just doesn't happen to be a great one. And then our best one of the year is, of course, during the coldest time. But the Geminids will be peaking December 13th through the 14th. Those will come out near Gemini. And we are looking at about 100 to 140 this year for a ZHR. So get your parkas on and get a comfy chair and go ahead and go out and look for those in December. So these are regular meteor showers. They happen every year and they're left over from a comet's debris field from the tail. So now that we're talking about comets, let's think about those. We just had one in our sky quite recently. It was called the Comet Neowise. So let's go check that out. We're going to go back about a month or so to July 14th. And let's head over to the northwest. And we're going to head back to about 1015. So some of you might have heard of this one or seen it. So the comet Neowise was in the northwest sky in the evening around mid-July. Now this was about a three mile wide comet, so we didn't even know about it until the end of March of this year. So that's why uh, we um, nobody was really talking about it until it was in our sky. But this is the comet Neowise. And it was naked eye, it was quite bright. And let's take a zoom, let's zoom in on it just a little bit. So here we go, there's a comet nucleus and then there's this beautiful tail that comes off of the comet as well. Now a lot of people are asking like, why isn't the comet moving? Like, is it moving like a meteor would? 
uh, or is it in the same spot? This was a very common question we were asked when it was up because we tend to think of comets as something similar to meteors. This is a common idea about what comets are, that they'll zoom across the sky much like that meteor that we saw before. But that's not what comets do. They are more like a planet. So let's zoom out and look towards the south real quick. So in the south right now, in the southeast, we have the planets Jupiter and Saturn. So this was in July, if we go back to August 13th. You can see they've moved in our sky, they've shifted their position relative to one another ever so slightly. Let's check that out. Whoop. And boom. So they are shifting, but on a very minor sense over the course of mo the months. Comets are behaving like planets. They're not going to just zoom across our sky, but they're also not static like the stars. They are moving slightly every night. So going back to July in the Northwest. So here's Comet Neowise. You can see at around 1015 in the evening on July 13th, it was very low in the sky. But as we go through July each night, it shifts its position. While you're looking at it, it's not going to move. But night to night, it'll move through the sky because it is orbiting. Meteors actually interact with our atmosphere and they fall through our atmosphere and potentially can leave something behind. Comets are in orbit around the sun, much like what we saw before when we were looking at the Comet Swift Tuttle. So here is the Comet Swift Tuttle again with its orbit. So it's staying in orbit around the sun and it doesn't actually interact with the Earth or fall to Earth in any way. So what happens is most of the time when they're going very slow, far away from the sun, they look like dirty snowballs is what is a very common way of talking about it. So here, for instance, is the comet 67P, or churyumov gerasienko And this is what it looks like sort of up close when it doesn't really have a tail. It kind of looks like an asteroid almost, um, but it's got a lot more water ice involved and other frozen gases. And then as this comet nucleus gets closer and closer to the sun, it's going to affect the comet. So the sunlight heats it up, and it causes the gases to change from solid ice forms directly into a gas, and we call that sublimation. So if you think about an ice cube, and you were to place it right on a counter, and then wait a few days, you'll see that ice cube melt into a puddle, so it'll change from solid to a liquid, and then after a few more days, it's going to evaporate and turn from a liquid into a gas. With uh, sublimation, you have something that's solid and it immediately gets turned into a gas. So think more like throwing an ice cube maybe into a frying pan. It goes from ice cube straight to steam. It kind of skips over that melting point. And so that's what's going on with the comet. So the heat from the sun warms it up and that causes the gases to turn, or the frozen versions of the gases to turn into, um, uh, directly into a gas. And so you can kind of see this. We actually sent a spacecraft to go hang out with this comet nucleus as it got closer to the sun so we could watch this process up close. So you might be able to see right in the middle there uh, where the comet kind of dips around, there's a little bit of gas that's coming off of it. So that tail is starting to form in this picture. And then as the comet gets closer and closer to the sun, it'll heat up more and more and then we'll get more of a tail. And the tail is always pointing away. And I think that might be why some of us like to think about comets as something that zooms, because it has this tail and that suggests some sort of direction. But the tail isn't because it's moving necessarily, it's because it's going around the sun. And the sun has solar wind. And so it's going to push the tail away from the sun. So there's this dust tail that gets left behind that kind of has a bit of a curve because it's moving along in its orbit that's ca causing the curve. But some of those gases have charged particles. 
So we get a gas tail of charged particles that are interacting with the sun's magnetic field that are pointing it directly away from the sun. So when we look at comets like hale bopp here, we see that dust tail as the big bright white tail that's behind that we always think about with comets. But there's always a second tail that's this charged ionized tail that's being point, directly pointed away from the sun because of the sun's magnetic field. So that's where the tail's coming from. It's actually a direct interaction with the sun. And then as that comet gets closer and closer, that tail gets bigger and bigger. And then as it starts to move back away, it'll start to shrink and it will go back to just being a nucleus out in the outer solar system hanging out. So these are the, uh, this is how a comet behaves. It's something that stays in orbit around the sun. It doesn't have a direct interaction with the Earth other than to let us see it. So let's go take a closer look again at Stellarium in our night sky and see what Neowise has been up to. So here we go. So here's Comet Neowise. You can see that the sunlight is still kind of glowing just a little bit in the northwest. So when we take a closer look at that tail, you can see it was pointing away from the sun. It always points away from that sun. And then as we continue going through, July, the comet got fainter because this is when it was on its way out. It was getting harder and harder to see. And as we go through into August, it disappears from view. And this comet has about a 6,800 year orbit, so it will not be back in our lifetimes. Other comets, they're a little bit closer. So for instance, the Perseid meteor shower is caused by the comet Swift-Tuttle that we were looking at. And that one has about 133 year orbit. It just came by a few years ago, so we'll have to wait another 120 years or so before it comes back. But um, 126, I think. But we've got all right here our comet Neowise that is now disappearing. And just like Neowise didn't show up uh, on our radar at all until late March of this year, there might be more for us to see. They are a bit fickle on how quickly and um, brilliantly their tails will form. So when sometimes we'll hear about a comet and then we don't see anything and sometimes we won't know about a comet until we see it in the sky. So comets are really fun and they are really beautiful. Now the last thing I want to bring up is we've been looking at solar system objects. We've been looking at meteors and meteor showers and comets and almost everything, everything we've talked about have been objects that live within our solar system, our home uh, where we live. So it's our asteroid belt. The comets originate much farther out beyond Jupiter for the most part. Uh, meteors and meteor showers are these remnants that get pulled into Earth. But we did have an interstellar visitor recently, a few years ago. It's now been named Oumuamua. And this is uh, the very first object that's been confirmed to enter our solar system, whip around the sun, and then head back out. So it's not a part of our solar system. It was truly an interstellar visitor. And so this was a particularly exciting object to check out. Uh, so this is an artist's rendition of what we think it looked like based off of all the data, but it is on its way out of the solar system again, and we will never see this um, come by us. So this is, uh, this is really special, and now that we've kind of been able to spot it, we should hopefully start to be able to spot more of these interstellar visitors. If you are interested in what is up in the night sky and these more regular things that happen, like meteor showers, you can subscribe to the Abrams Planetarium Sky Calendar, and you can do that online at abramsplanetarium.org slash sky calendar. This is something we produce every month. It's been going on for almost 52 years now. Uh, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary in 2018. And uh, you can see that it's laid out in a calendar format, so you can go ahead and figure out where to look and what time to look each day of the month to see what is going on. 
But that is this video, and I hope you guys had some fun and you learned something. We will be opening up our meteorite exhibit here um, as soon as all of this is over, and you'll be able to come check that out and see all of our Michigan meteorites as well as others, including Canyon Diablo. So uh, we'll visit. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to visit us soon. And until then, have a great time, and see you later. Bye-bye.